Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. I am Zach, your chill companion to the world of leftist literature. And tonight, I'm going to be bringing you the audiobook uh, version of The Conquest of Bread, and we're going to be doing Chapter 10. And my special guest tonight is going to be Carl Schultz, and he'll be joining me momentarily to do commentary and to get through it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. But uh, we may not get to them right away since we're going to try and, and keep the, the flow moving pretty well. Uh, so just so, you, just so you know. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give Carl a call and we'll get things rolling. Let's get it going. Hello. Hello. Hey, hey. How are you doing tonight, Carl? Good, how are you? Not too bad. So if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with the audience first your pronouns and then just as much of your bio as you feel comfortable sharing, and then we'll get into the book. Uh, my name's Carl. Um, he, him. Um, I'm 40 years old, and I've just kind of taken the deep dive in the officially <laughs> calling myself a communist or leftist or whatever you want to say. Sure. Um, uh, it's kind of something that's always been in my head, I guess, when I, yeah. since I was little, like, you know, I, um, you know, when I was a little kid and I used to fantasize about winning the lottery, it always involved making a big commune type place, even though yeah. I didn't realize that's what I was imagining. Man, I can <laughs> like a big to place that. for all my friends to hang out and play all day. And, and as I got older, uh, um, I guess I, you could say the propaganda got to me. Oh, I mean, it happens to us all. <laughs> it's it's hard to avoid. It really is. People don't realize how pernicious and, and, and you know, pervasive it is. You know, it's, it's oh, yeah. all throughout high school, even through college. Like I myself never took a course where everyone even mentioned Marx or, or any alternative uh, mode of, of production. <laughs> so I can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, also, I'm a I'm a military brat, so oh, that okay. that's an extra element there. I believe, um, I believe you'll I be the first uh, guest that I've had that has that background. So that'll be that'll be really cool to to have that uh -oh. added perspective. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also a veteran. I don't know if I I was in the Air Force for eight years. Oh, I thought that's what you meant. So, uh, gotcha. Well, no, no, no. Um, I mean, my dad was in the Navy too. I see. I see. I grew up. And then my dad was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And um, so and also my parents were really kind of religious. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to step on any toes or anything, but there's a there's a, definitely a lot of anti-communist sentiment. Oh, for sure. At least, the, at least the circles that I grew up in. For sure. Um, all right. I mean, yeah, there's, there's definitely anti-communist and, and, you know, anti any sort of leftist sentiment pretty much wherever you go in this country. So, but yeah, it can be especially bad when you also have religious indoctrination on top of that as well. So, I, But yeah. it's kind of funny because I think it had like the opposite effect that it, uh -huh. of what it intended because growing up in the military and with those, you know, they call them Judeo-Christian values. Um, sure you know, love your neighbor and everyone's God's children. And I, you know, I got to see a lot of the world and a lot of different cultures. So I, I think maybe that might've had a profound effect on me. Um, That's seeing awesome, all that. I, I had a similar experience. I, I did uh, AmeriCorps after high school. So I did a year of, of different service projects around the country. And man, did that open up my mind, just, just seeing different ways that people live. Like, like It's as simple as that, really. It really puts a bit different perspective in your mind that there's a whole lot more out there that you've never even dreamed of or really considered. You know, and Yeah, I, I remember actually when I was in the military, um, <laughs> This was one of the first times someone made me think this. They uh, they brought up the fact that how f funny it is that um, shoot, I'm bomb. I'm totally ruining this. But no, no, you're doing fine. About, you're doing great. About uh, uh, um, Mary, the Virgin Mary. Sure. About what a crazy story that is. That like, oh yeah, no, it, I didn't have sex with anyone. It's the no. Lord came and visited me. 
and like everyone laughed and i kind of realized like that is kind of crazy <laughs> like, yeah it, it, it's strange when you when you grow up in it it's it's like how yeah. there's that one analogy about how you know if you told a fish what water was they never would believe you because they just grew up swimming and it. it's just it's second nature and so yeah. it, it's hard to know perspectives when or other perspectives when you've you've grown up basically in one I mean, and that's true for basically anyone and you know wherever you go as, as long as you're not moving around all that much that's going to be the case you're going to get you know virtually just one or or maybe a few a handful of perspectives so yeah that, that's cool though to see though when you when you go out there and you, you do realize that other people see things radically differently than you do. Oh yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I had all this thought out before, but oh, my no mind problem. Take going your right time. Now. <laughs> Take your time. We're we're definitely very casual on this channel, so so no pressure uh, at all. <laughs> um. Oh, but I think one of the biggest. I was thinking. Or, um, one of the biggest. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I guess the moment where I saw kind of behind the curtain, I guess you could say, was sure. the bailouts of 2008 and 2009. Oh, my. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I was in the military and I remember sitting in like I was in a like in the hospital waiting room or something. I don't remember mm -hmm. what for. Mm -hmm. but I remember watching it on the on the TV screen and just kind of being completely disillusioned. Like, I know what the hell That's I thought. I thought they were taking the risk. So if you take a risk, right. that means you're going to fail, right? Right. That's what they put in your brain so, all this time. And so then, we're going to fail them out, and then we all keep failing. Okay. Right. And all of a sudden, they're too big to fail. Like that that term just seems to have been just coined out of nowhere just for that one occasion. All of a sudden, these these companies, they're they're too big to fail because – They've grown so large that they would just be like a, a, a domino effect on the rest of the economy. That blew my mind when I first heard that term. Like too big to fail. Like, yeah, what's that? That's that's supposed to be like the opposite of what cap. Ca you're right. Capitalism is supposed to all be about entrepreneurship and taking risk and like like all this this stuff. You know, working without a safety net and all, and, and even safety nets are disdained for when it comes to poor people. But apparently, they're just fine. When it comes to the 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 uber wealthy and and successful, so yeah, that was definitely a big awakening for for me too. And then and then getting into the whole Occupy movement and and all the stuff came later. Later, that definitely was was big in in my move leftward as well. Yeah, um, that's one thing that kept coming to me when I was thinking about my journey to the left. Yeah. To the left, yeah. All the the little setbacks, because like there was all these moments where like. I should have been radicalized, but something <laughs> kind of came in and distracted me, you know? Oh, I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but, um, oh, more specifically, um, you said, uh, I think you said something about 2016. No, but we're, we're definitely, that's definitely or... the next place to, to go in the, in the timeline but... for most people. Yeah. That's definitely yeah, the turning yeah. point. Ferguson, all that. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. I got really, really upset with the whole police brutality and kind of went on a Facebook reposting rage. Mm. And uh, I had someone that I was in the military with that then went into the police force. Yeah. Uh, he contacted me. I was like, Hey man, like kind of like trying to talk me down. And, you know, I guess I kind of either, it didn't really calm me down, but it made me realize, um, I guess that people are watching mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I didn't know what to do with all that anger. So like, I just kind of had to, or I, I felt at least like I just had to push it down and ignore it. And so I unfollowed the pages and oh, wow. tried to forget about it for a while. And, and I guess it was kind of the, uh, the pandemic mm -hmm. what, what snapped me back into reality. Back for you. Yeah. And just, and then, um, <laughs> The thing that got, it's kind of funny, the thing that got me specifically reading up on Marx mm -hmm. was my cousin posted something about Black Lives Matter. And um, my dad got on there and said something to the effect of, like, of course, Black Lives Matter, but that's a, that's a Marxist organization. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what? Yeah. Why is that? Why you say that like it's... Like, like it's a, a bad really thing. bad, yeah, like a terrible thing. 
So I was like, what? Let me let me see what this is. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of that's how I ended up um, a fledgling Marxist Leninist, I guess. Wow. wow. Yeah. Good for you for, for finally taking that leap, though, too. Um, yeah, it, it, it's amazing how much there, there's still so much stigma around those words to the point where it can just be you know, just a thought stopper, basically, where as soon as you mention communist or socialism or any of these sorts of things, people's brain just goes blank. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, I don't got to listen to that idea because it's clearly ridiculous. It's not even worth considering. I've been taught since I was six that that's bad. So, yeah, I don't even have to listen to the rest of it. For sure. Whatever you have to say. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Well, cool. All right. Um, and so I don't know if you mentioned, but uh, what part of the country do you find yourself in these days? Oh, I'm in North Carolina right now. Very cool. Very cool. Would you say that there's would you say that there's any kind of uh, growing movement around you of leftism at all? Not that I can see. Yeah. But um, when I get into the more urban areas, I'm pretty rural. Uh-huh. But when I get into the more urban areas, I, I've seen some things like just the other week we saw um, – some the people from food not bombs out oh seriously um, yeah that's, that's good to and, know uh, i think it was in raleigh raleigh All that right. was cool that is but very um nice. i love that yeah i'm out in, i'm out in farmland so okay it's uh yeah do, do you have, do you have some here. acreage yourself that's under production at all uh i have a uh what do you mean under production oh yeah are you growing like even like a hobby farm or anything like that oh to... Oh, no, not quite yet. We have a little bit of land that my wife was able to get from her grandmother. Very cool. Um, she kind of like helped her buy it, I guess. But um, and then I helped her buy another little part of it that we were actually talking about what we're going to do with it today. But oh, nothing nice. quite yet. Um, I was just trying to stay afloat right now. Yeah, well, I can relate to that as well. Yeah. Have you, have you looked into uh, permaculture at all? No, but I was listening <laughs> when trying to get caught up. I heard right. you talking about it and I definitely want to get more caught up on that. It's, it's <laughs> and an uh, I think there's philosophy. something else. Oh, you, that's with like the um, the fish tank that recirculates and all that, that type that, stuff. That would be one way of, of doing it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like. Uh, the idea is to more or less mimic nature and to create ecosystems, whether it's out on the land or whether it's in more a controlled environment where you have like an indoor, you know, uh, aquaponics operation where you have the, the food growing in, in a water solution that, that's fish water that you circulate around. That, that could be an example of permaculture. But basically what it comes down to is, is a set of, of three ethics, those being care for the earth, care for people and return the surplus to the the uh to the further the 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 first two principles and then there's a bunch Mm -hmm. of prints and then there's a bunch of uh or the first two ethics i should say and then there's a bunch of principles that have been laid out things like uh produce no waste um Mm -hmm. value the marginal you know all all these sorts of things but it's basically a design framework you it's mostly applied to agriculture but i mean you could use it to design a closet or a business (laughs) or anything you want really but, but yeah, it's most often used for agriculture. So that's where most of the research has been done as well. And most of the demonstration projects that you can take a look at, plenty of them are online too. Just like, I mean, even if you just put in permaculture into the into a YouTube search bar, uh, you can come up with some pretty cool ideas just right off the bat. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Well, definitely. I mean, I, ha- I have my uh, permaculture design certificate. I've, I've gone through the training, so... You know, definitely. If you if you ever want to pick my brain about any of that sort of thing, I'm I'm definitely open for that. I love, oh, I love yeah. design work. I love thinking about food systems. So so definitely. Yeah, that's actually something I've been trying to move towards myself is being able to grow as much food for ourselves as we can. That's awesome. And uh, if possible, of for course. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that third ethic there. You know, share the surplus, which I think fits really nicely into a lot of leftist systems of like mutual aid and then that sort of thing um so i I think there's real potential for for overlap between those two theories and i I try to blend in as much as i can when i when i'm doing like this this stream and stuff like that try to bring in those permaculture ideas as well as some stuff about urban planning as well because that's my also my background i have have a master's degree in urban planning which i haven't found a use for yet but (laughs) (laughs) 
you know, at least I have the background. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's useful in my private life, just not for my my vocation, I guess. I imagine point. it would just make me angry at the way that cities are laid out. I mean, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> How car it's like I already feel that. But now then that would give me the theory to back up my anger. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's, it's always good to have theory to back up your anger. Which is basically what I've been doing the last six months reading up on Marx and Lenin. So. Oh, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> has, has there been a particular title that stood out for you? Um, I've really latched on to the Marx Madness podcast. Oh, they're one of the best ones out there that discuss yeah. theory. They're so good. They're great. Yeah, because they. Um, I like how they, uh, they bring in a lot of... Uh, modern modern day references for sure you know because that stuff's a lot of it's so, so it's like reading the bible almost it's you know? very dry that, that there's <laughs> yeah. no better way of saying it yeah a lot of it's very dry like even the book or, we're going through tonight is it's it's a little bit dry because he's trying to be very academic about it but yeah definitely. right yeah i actually brought up a, a copy of it so i could read along because oh, i was a little cool. worried very about cool. I don't Keeping actually have up a physical just, copy, so I'll, I'll just be going along uh, with the audio. Oh, I found it on the anarchistlibrary.org. Oh, of course. Yeah, I suppose I could pull up a PDF if I really wanted to. All right. Well, very cool. Is there anything else you want to, to say about your, your background or your bio or whatever before we get into uh, things? I don't think so. I'm sure there's something I forgot. Hey, but... no problem. And if you ever want to bring it up in, in the conversation, you know, I, I like to keep things pretty open and freewheeling. So, you know, don't don't hesitate to go off on tangents. Those can sometimes be some of the most productive parts of the conversation. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the book then. Right. And we are on uh, chapter 10 tonight. And uh, the title of the chapter is Agreeable Work. So we're going to learn what Kropotkin thinks about what makes for agreeable work. And let's get going. This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 10, Agreeable Work, Part 1. Oh, and just to make sure, is the sound coming through for you as well, Carl? Yes. All right, very good. Let's continue. All right. When socialists declare that a society emancipated from capital would make work agreeable and would suppress all repugnant and unhealthy drudgery, they get laughed at. And yet, even today, we see the striking progress made in this direction. And wherever this progress has been achieved, employers congratulate themselves on the economy of energy obtained thereby. It is evident that a factory could be made as healthy and pleasant as a scientific laboratory, and it is no less evident that it would be advantageous to make it so. In a spacious and well-ventilated factory, work is better. It is easy to introduce small ameliorations, of which each represents an economy of time or of manual labor. And if most of the workshops we know are foul and unhealthy, it is because the workers are of no account in the organization of factories and because the most absurd waste of human energy is its distinctive feature. Nevertheless, now and again, we find some factories so well managed that it would be a real pleasure to work in them if the work, be it well understood, were not to last more than four or five hours a day, and everyone had the possibility of varying it according to his tastes. Look at this factory, unfortunately consecrated to engines of war. It is perfect as far as regards sanitary and intelligent organization. It occupies 50 English acres of land, 15 of which are roofed with glass. The pavement of fireproof bricks is as clean as that of a miner's cottage, and the glass roof is carefully cleaned by a gang of workmen who do nothing else. In this factory are forged steel ingots, or blooms, weighing as much as 20 tons, and when you stand 30 feet from the immense furnace, whose flames have a temperature of more than a thousand degrees, you do not guess its presence, save when its great jaws open to let out a steel monster. And the monster is handled by only three or four workmen who now here, now there, open a tap, causing immense cranes to move by pressure of water in the pipes. You enter expecting to hear the deafening noise of stampers and you find that there are no stampers. The immense hundred ton guns and the crankshafts of transatlantic steamers are forged by hydraulic pressure. And instead of forging steel, the worker has but to turn a tap to give it shape, which makes a far more homogeneous metal, without crack or flaw, of the blooms, whatever be their thickness. We expect an infernal grating, and we find machines which cut blocks of steel 30 feet long with no more noise than is needed to cut cheese. And when we expressed our admiration to the engineer who showed us round, he answered, It is a mere question of economy. 
This machine, the plain steel, has been in use for 42 years. It would not have lasted 10 years if its component parts, badly adjusted, lacking in cohesive strength, interfered and creaked at each movement of the plane. And the blast furnaces? It would be a waste to let the heat escape instead of utilizing it. Why roast the founders when heat lost by radiation represents tons of coal? The stampers that made the building shake five leagues off were also a waste. It is better to forge by pressure than by impact, and it costs less. There is less loss. Just going to pause it there for a second. So I think that the two ideas that, that I'm bringing out from, from this part of it so far is uh, one, Kropotkin's uh, pretty much rosy outlook for um, increases in technology to make work easier, as he says, more, or as the title says, more agreeable, and mm. that, you know, I, I, I'm assuming, I, I don't know for sure, but I would assume that in his time, factories were pretty awful places where there was a lot of danger, a lot of smoke, a lot of noise, and it was just pretty much almost unbearable. So I think he's trying to, to kind of soften the idea of, of work in the future. If people are, are kind of apprehensive about, you know, having to get a factory job if, if everyone needs to pull together to do one sort of operation or another. And then the other part of it, just the, the idea of having better worker or better working conditions through things like ventilation and, and other things. So he, he, I think what he's just trying to do is endear himself a little bit to, to the worker. What, what are you getting from this part at all, Carl? Uh, to me, it kind of sounds like when Marx was talking about automation, mm -hmm. I think, um, about how just focusing on how, like, it, it doesn't sound like he's get, got there yet, but it sounds like he might be building yeah. towards it, saying like, oh, everything's so much nicer and more efficient, and we don't have to, you know, like, you are like you can see, it's quiet, and like he even says it, it's cuts through like it like it's cutting through cheese yeah <laughs> like and you only need and it even mentions it only needs three or four workers mm -hmm. um to do instead of having you know instead of having whole teams yeah a bunch of people with hammers banging on it and um so yeah i, don't, I feel like you might be working towards the trade-off though where yeah um and it, i mean it's kind of the 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 sad irony that that with capitalist production, because all these sorts of gains um, in technology end up settling at the top, even though work gets gets easier and, and has to be done by by fewer and fewer people. It also at the same time means that people get let go who are at the bottom. And, yep. you know, and also because of the capitalist, the the owner and and worker relationship, uh, even if you're you're business gets more efficient at what it does uh because of your contract with them they get to decide what to do with that that extra profit that's now been shaken loose from not having the, the same sort of you know friction in, in getting the same amount of work done so you know i i think he's well i think there's definitely a a good contrast to make then with some sort of a worker-owned situation where yeah People are all deciding democratically what to do with that extra gain. That that makes technology gains a, a more of a, a a happy thing for the workers, you know, because it, it would mean less, it'd be more leisure time potentially, and and more profit, um, if you even want to call it profit at that point, but but more money in the, in the pocket of the average worker. Mm. So, yeah, all right. Yeah, we... all for all. <laughs> all for I'm all. trying to stay away from the Marxist Leninist phraseology or whatever. Oh, that's okay. I mean, because uh, yeah, like if it's it, you, if it's capitalist owned, then all the profits and that you're getting from saving the time and the labor is going straight to the capitalist. Straight but if it's to state the capitalist. Owned, it to the, yeah, and if it's state owned by a worker state, yeah, then it goes to the workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even so, if even if it's, it's there, you go. You know, and, and there's some people that would that would characterize a a uh, country like China as as more of um, state capitalist, where the state becomes the capitalist. But even in that yeah. sort of arrangement, still you have more control over the state as as a member of of say the Chinese Communist Party than you do over even the state in this country, for example. Um, okay. So 
So even in that arrangement, even if you don't believe the, the hype about uh, China's socialist leanings or, or socialist reality, uh, still you have more of, of that that gain in, in production going back to the people because you exactly know, you, you have more money in your your government budgets to to fund social programs. So yeah, I, I definitely I'm, I'm not against uh, communism in any way. Uh, <laughs> even though I, I tend to prefer the anarchist side, I, I I definitely believe in left unity. I think that anything past capitalism is is going to be a step in the right direction. So yeah. Personally, I feel more like an anarchist. I just mm-hmm. think I think that like the Marxist Leninist is the most the best way to get us all to sure. be individual anarchists, you know, yeah. and, and really when it comes <laughs> down to it. I mean, I've seen so many dumb leftist fights online. I'm sure you have. As oh, well. God. Yeah. But when it comes That's... down to it, it, yeah, it's mostly just about how do we get there and, and how we make sure that when we yeah. get there, things are equitably distributed amongst all or, the people. I mean, this may sound kind of snarky, but just fighting over what to call it. Well, that too. Oh, yes. You know, I'm no. you like know, whether it's a I council have, or a committee. Or right. A... I have 13 different adjectives to it to attach to my specific brand of leftism and all the rest of you all. You all are just, you know, crazy. I don't know how you even get to, to your ideas and stuff like yeah. that. It's 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 just nonsense. And I mean, so much of it is just people bored online that you get yeah, <laughs> a lot of it stir just, shit up so yeah social media has yeah it's just innately or inherently kind of it brings out the worst in people i think oh it definitely can because you have that that like shroud of anonymity that you can just sit oh, behind yeah. and like lob grenades at, at whoever you feel like and, and you don't have to look no at their face yeah you don't have to look <laughs> at their face you don't have to like see them you know feel bad even <laughs> so yeah Definitely. So, yeah, I think leftist unity, definitely bottom line, is, is the best mm-hmm. way to do things. Not not least of which, because especially in countries like a, a, the United States, um, the left represents such a, a tiny portion of the population at this point that we can't really afford to be that, yeah. you know, picky and, and choosy about, about who we exactly. call allies. So I think, you know, at least for the time being, we all can agree that capitalism sucks. We all can agree... <laughs> that it's not doing the most for the most people and that you know at least trying a different system is is preferable to staying where we're at so yeah that's just my take but hey, let, let's continue on. i agree 100 percent. very good awesome in a factory light planning less the space allotted to each bench is but of a simple question of economy work is better done when you can see and you have elbow room It is true, he said. We were very cramped before coming here. Land is so expensive in the vicinity of large towns. Landlords are so grasping. It is even so in mines. We know what mines are like nowadays from Zola's descriptions and from newspaper reports. But the mine of the future will be well ventilated, with a temperature as easily regulated as that of a library. There will be no horses doomed to die below the earth. Underground traction will be carried on by a means of an automatic cable put in motion at the pit's mouth. Ventilators will always be working, and there will never be explosions. This is no dream. Such a mine is already to be seen in England. We went down it. Here again, this organization is simply a question of economy. The mine of which we speak, in spite of its immense depth, 466 yards, has an output of a thousand tons of coal a day, with only 200 miners, five tons a day per each worker, whereas the average of the 2,000 pits in England is hardly 300 tons a year per man. If necessary, we can multiply examples, proving that Fouillet's dream regarding material organization was not a utopia. This question has, however, been so frequently discussed in socialist newspapers that public opinion might have been educated. Factory, forge, and mine can be as healthy and magnificent as the finest laboratories in modern universities, and the better the organization, the more will man's labor produce. If it be so, can we doubt that work will become a pleasure and a relaxation in a society of equals, in which hands will not be compelled to sell themselves to toil and to accept work under any conditions? Repug- I'm just going to pause there for a second. Something that, that just came to mind. Um, I used to be, like in high school and stuff, I used to be really into like science fiction. 
And one of my favorite authors was Isaac Asimov. And, and he predicted this, this sort of world that he was just talking about, a life of leisure where all the machines basically do your work for you. And I mean, he's definitely more elaborate and, and further along in his thinking, like he had actual androids and stuff like that. But he predicted that uh, as production gets more and more um, scaled up and, and as people need to do less and less of the jobs in society, that just naturally people would be left with lives of kind of idleness where they could just pursue whatever you know, fancy they liked. And, and it's basically like uh, the idea of, of <laughs> like the fully automated luxury gay space communism. That's that's oh, what I mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember when I was in high school, though, I was like, oh, man, that's such a great idea. Except for, I mean, look at today. Like we, we, we have a bunch of stuff and, and, you know, it's probably a lot better than when he wrote this book. But, uh, you know, we don't all live lives of, of luxury yet. And, and, you know, as I got older, um, before I was really exposed to any sort of leftist idea, that idea just uh, that, you know, his, his, uh, that Isomov's vision was just a, a fantasy that was, is, is completely unrealistic. Uh, that just grew and grew in my mind. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a great thing. But, you know, what ends up happening is that the, the owners of these pr these machines end up taking all the reward. And that's, that is true. But I think that, that at the same time, what Kropotkin is talking about also could have been true. Like if, if everyone's owning things and we're all the owners, then we all would have gotten these, these upgrades in, in our, our living, our standards of living and, and potentially even gotten better leisure time, just kind of as we were talking about in the last passage there. So I, I don't see it as much of a fantasy anymore as just a wrong way of, of looking at things in the first place that, that, all the all the benefits don't have to actually go to the top. They they there's definitely other ways that we could organize things, where it would be more equitable and and we could live these lives of leisure. I mean, who knows in the future what sort of of greater innovations will come and, and how many jobs will be destroyed. Um, what what are your thoughts on on the idea that <clears throat> of leisure and, and automation and that sort of thing? I've had kind of the same. Um thought process where uh, that was used to be my fantasy of the future of yeah. like once things get so advanced we won't have to do anything yeah and then then i'd start as i got older i would learn that you know things didn't um things used to be harder in the past and they got easier but they're not easier for everyone <laughs> and so obviously like it's very uneven. that out and yeah um, I just, I, uh, sure. I never got to make it past that thought, I guess, until recently that, that the way out of that is for, you know, for communal ownership. Yeah. Like the, the all oh. for all that, that keeps running through this book, I think is really, yeah. really poignant in, in this sort of a, a vision for the future. Uh, another thing that just jumped out of me that, um, I feel a little naive about now, oh, sure. um, is I never thought about horses being done in mines before. You know what? I don't think I ever have either. That kind of shot. I almost had you pause it there. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. Hold on. That's terrible. Yeah. I'd never thought about that before. You know, that that's very true. Now I didn't even notice that when, when they said that just in the chapter here, but yeah, come to think of it. Like I've been out to like Colorado and been on all those like mine tours and, and stuff like that. And yeah. never did they talk about having horses. They, it was always like oh, some sort horse, of like yeah. somewhat automated system where like you push yeah, the line down into the cart and it would wind it up and it would kind of bring it most of the way back up the hill and then people would push the rest of the way. But yeah. Oh, that must have been a terrible life for a horse. Mm. Boy, I can't imagine. Yeah. Even, even just trying to train a, a horse to go down into a deep, dark hole. That's when I, I kind of doubt that that's the, a horse's natural inclination to, to want to do that sort of thing. Man, that is definitely something to think about. So yeah, life can be better for not just people, but but also horses oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, that's that's another important um, element, I think. Uh, but again, never mind. Maybe we shouldn't get into that. No, no. Let's let's take the time. Um, no problem. Uh, well, about uh, animal cruelty, like mm -hmm. I think that's very important. I think it's very important. Absolutely. But um. 
but it's also a point of division. It can be. And I don't, but I don't know if the people, if it's, I just wonder if it's real or if it's like injected, like sectarianism kind of, I don't yeah. know if, if that's a good term or not, or if, or if you know what I mean though, then I guess it is I like, if that's, if that's real, I don't want to say real leftist or whatever, but like, who would like put the, use that to divide people? Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. I think it is a similar sort of thing to the the you know, the super online leftists who who feel like picking a fight with everyone who's not quite as pure as them. I think the same sort yeah. of thing can be yeah. the case with like uh, the animal liberation movements and uh, the vegan movements and and these sorts of things. I, but again, I think I think it's the same sort of thing. If you were, if we were to all step back offline and kind of actually look at one another and, and actually talk things out, I think we would find that that more often than not, vegans and 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 people advocating against animal cruelty uh, are not so much uh, are, are not as militant as they're portrayed to be by their more vocal uh, comrades. Let's say, like uh, I know, I, I mean, veganism is, is pretty big in my family, and and none of my family is, is very, you know, really even all that, I guess, evangelical for lack of a better word about it. Like they do their thing. They, they, they have their beliefs and they, and they can definitely back them up, but they're not like shrieking at people who are, they see like yeah. eating a, a hamburger on the street or something like that. Yeah. That's a good, I got, I've honestly never come across the stereotypical vegan. Yeah. I, I mean, I've only ever, again, I think I've only ever seen them online. And, and yeah. at that, it's usually not even them directly. It's it's usually someone pointing to a video, being like, "Oh, vegans are like this," and it's just it's just <laughs> that same sort of division, but from the other side. So yeah, yeah. But I think definitely um, the ideas of, of liberating not just people, but but all forms of life, and and creating systems that are as humane as possible for for all systems. That's definitely a place that permaculture can definitely play a big role in that because. Permaculture is, is, in my mind, kind of the antithesis of the factory farm. So rather than having, uh, you know, high capacity confinement areas, we're looking for things like pasture, because the idea is to have as few resources brought in from outside as possible. So you, you put your cows out on pasture, they live basically a nice pastoral life as, as they're out there munching on their hay, and, and yet they get to live full, long cow lives as, as, as good as a cow life could ever be. And then, uh, depending on how the farmer feels about it at the, at the end of their, uh, life cycle, they may just experience, uh, as painless of a death as possible. And then, and then that's it. They go to sustain the rest of, of, or it's to sustain plenty of families who themselves are, are trying to be part, more part of the ecosystem. So I think that definitely can can play yeah. into these sorts of ideas for sure. Yeah, like I think there's a lot of sustainability and like a lot of the the problems with eating meat comes from the factory farming Absolutely. and the, all that. Like I'm not saying you shouldn't be a vegan though, like right. at all. I don't have any problem with it. Mm -hmm. Um I actually kind of wish I could go yeah. at least closer. But um I well, it can definitely be hard, especially in, in rural areas where they might not have as many alternatives. Oh, yeah. And uh, people more means challenged, if you will. <laughs> yeah, indeed, too. And that's that's definitely something that needs to be part of the conversation. You know, that there's the there's the, the saying that there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Well, that that applies to to things like people not being able to buy higher quality of food. You know, they, or being forced, you know, into narrow channels of, of what food that, that they are able to afford. And we need to be sensitive to that sort of thing as leftists, I would say, and, yeah. and not just judge them based on wherever we are, you know, especially if we are in a more um, fortunate or, or privileged spot where we can have those choices. You know, there's, there's not a lot of choice under capitalism. As, as much as they, they tout choice for this and that, it's it's, you know... You know, we got 52 types of, of, of Mr. Pib or Dr. Pepper, and we have, you know, 35 types of, of ketchup or mustard or whatever. Like, that's all just kind of illusionary choice. Like, yeah. When it comes down to it, people are going to look at, well, what can I afford? First and foremost, I mean, that's going to be most people going to the store. And then besides that, what do I like? You know, and 
are you really going to be that much worse off? And what do I have? What do I have time for too? And what do I have time for as well? That that's definitely a big yeah. thing. The Especially more healthy food takes longer to prepare. It, it absolutely yeah. does. And and if you're one of those people that In that general. are um, unlucky enough to have a minimum wage job or even basically twice the minimum wage job, what what they're talking about raising it to you at, at fifteen dollars, even at that point. It's very hard to live on in most parts of the country on just, you know, between seven and fifteen dollars an hour. It's just mm. it's just not really all that feasible. So if if you are in that situation, almost certainly you're going to have another job as well, or at least a part time job. So, you know, or a roommate, or, or yeah, a roommate, yeah. I mean, yeah, or or all of that sort of, stuff. yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, as many cost saving things as possible. But but you know the the lower down in, in on the economic ladder you are, really the less choices you have. So that's definitely something that we need to, to keep in mind as we're, you know, trying to say how a better way of living might be. You know? Yeah, and, yeah. And to keep in mind when you're trying to approach people, I think is to maybe ha- keep that in mind to help, help with your compassion, I guess that, mm-hmm. that, um, yeah, people have hard lives. People so. have hard lives. And everyone's on a different part of their journey. So, and, and that applies to like even leftism too. Like, I hate it when people are really condescending to to new leftists and like, oh, you haven't read this, that, and the other thing. Get back to me when you've read this stack of books. And then just walk. <laughs> that, that's so like unhelpful. That's why to I the stayed quiet movement. for so long, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate that sort of thing. I want to do the opposite. I'm I'm super excited that anyone's interested in this sort of same thing that I am. Like, I, I think this is all really cool stuff and really great ideas. And I love to share it. <laughs> We're getting a, a comment in chat. Uh, Mike Dixie wrecked. I think I remember you from before commies rule Trumpies drool. Well, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't find any fault in that one. So, uh, I appreciate the comment for that. So, yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, uh, what kind of uh, farming is, is like the predominant form kind of out where you're at? It seems to be corn, corn. uh, cotton or soy. Oh, okay. It seems, I, I'm, uh, I don't really have the eye for it, but I think I, from what I can tell, it's what it looks like. The, the soy is the only part I'm not sure on. It might be something else, Mm -hmm. but, um, that's similar to Minnesota. Like that, that those are two main you know, staple crops, I guess they're not, I mean, that's kind of a misnomer really. When you, when you look at where all the corn goes to like actual corn that goes into food is like way down on the list. I don't know if you Oh, tobacco heard. too. Sorry. Oh, tobacco too. Okay. So it's yeah, even hot enough. I forgot about tobacco. that. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. The fields probably smell pretty good then when those, when those tobacco <laughs> blossoms oh, bloom. Oh, I, around me, just pigs. <laughs> oh, it's just pigs around. Oh, and, that's one well, of the worst. I got to say, yeah. like the high density pig farms, that's one of the worst smells I've ever smelled. Yeah. That um, sucks, man. Yeah. And I'm also in a flood zone. So um, there's, I think there's been some times where the, like, you know, they, they have those lagoons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where they deal with that too. Yeah. I think one of them, like, I don't know if the water got up into it and then, you know, it mixed in and then f- flooded out or what, but yeah. like the, the water around the ground around here can get pretty gross when it floods, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, my wife told me I've, I've only lived out here for about, Oh shoot. Like 10 years now. But she said that there was one flood. It might've been, uh, Floyd. I think that was in like 1999 or so that there was like pig carcasses and stuff Ooh. in the boat around. Ugh. That sucks. That's really <laughs> yeah. bad. Yeah, we, we, we've had problems with, uh, with pig farming, high density pig farming operations out in Minnesota as well. Like entire towns come out to, to uh, go against that because it's just, it's just so awful the way they do it. It's one, it's one reason that I decided not to eat pork anymore at all, just because I can't, I can't stand contributing to that sort of thing. So I, I, I do eat meat. I, I do eat, you know, seafood and stuff like that. But, uh, but I, I definitely put my limits on things like pork just because it's such a terrible operation. I feel right. so bad for those. And pigs are really smart, too. I feel bad for those pigs having to um, just kind of sit around. And I mean, I know they like mud, but I mean, they also like roaming around, I'm sure, too, and like 
having social lives and stuff like that, not just standing <laughs> shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, so anyway, what I was saying was was about corn. Like, um, if you look at the breakdown of where U.S. corn goes, um, the 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 number one, I think. I think goes to feed corn. So, so it just goes, it's just going into making animal protein basically. Mm -hmm. And then like three, four and five, like, like there's a whole bunch of other ones that are like ethanol export corn syrup. And then like way, way down. It's like only like 2% of the, the actual corn that that's produced actually goes to like, you know, canned corn or, or even corn oh, or, wow. cob or things like that. It's, it's really, so it's crazy to think of that as like a staple, but that's definitely how people look at it out here is like, yeah, or I think it's like a commodity. Oh, I think it's mostly feed corn out here. That, yeah, I mean that's that's going to be the case. Just across. I've heard country. of some sweet corn, like some, mm -hmm. every, like uh, some places I've worked, they've been like, "Hey, come get some sweet corn." Whatever his name down the road just had a harvest, and it's all got two truckloads left, or so, you know. Oh, nice. So I mean, so there is a little bit of that. Of it seems like there's a little bit of everything out here. We're that's also cool. near a Marine Corps base. Uh, oh really? Okay. Yeah, Cherry Point is out here. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, it's like maybe forty-five minutes from where I live, but mm -hmm. it, it it just changes the dynamic of the town, you know. Like so, like For there's sure. a lot of retired military around, mm -hmm. and uh, it's like old farmland that got cut up and turned into just poor people land i guess <laughs> i don't know what to call it that's, that's sad to hear it's, i mean trailer parks and uh, yeah so so has there been like a big kind of exodus to the the larger cities and other parts of the country and stuff i don't i'm not sure okay. uh like i've been here 10 years and it's just it's kind of like country folk laid back don't want to work too hard you know Sure. Right. <laughs> like uh, who does though i mean oh, when yeah, i first got here sure. it kind of annoyed me but now i'm like you guys okay you know i got it <laughs> well, that, that's that's funny that's cool though. i i do love the countryside you know i i've never lived really out in the country but i've definitely been out to it enough to to really appreciate just kind of that that sort of of lifestyle as well there's a lot to be said there's for it. There's a couple factories around here, oh. too. Are they, like, um, processing plants or something like that? Um, I don't think so. Uh, there's, I know there's, um, there's Bosch, because I used to work for Bosch. Okay. They make... I worked at the, the warehouse distribution center. Sure. But um, there's also a plant where they make, like, cooktops and dishwashers and stuff. Oh, okay. And then there's a mowing plant... Hmm. They make like faucets and oh, yes. all like toilets and I don't know at all. But yeah. I'm, I'm a delivery driver, so I deliver that stuff to, oh, okay. to Menards all the time. Menards is our, okay. our like Home Depot out here. Yeah, I used to. I w when I was in the Air Force, I was at um, Offit in Nebraska, so oh, okay. we had we had Menards out there. Cool. Oh, I didn't realize it came out that far. I thought it was more like just Minnesota, Wisconsin thing. That's interesting. That's cool. Um. Just a second, I want to address uh, the guy in chat here. Um, just so you know, this is not going to be a, a debate um, stream, Mr. Uh, Mike Dixierect. So uh, we're not going to go off on tangents about whatever you want. Sorry about that. I've listed the book in the corner there. It's also in the title, so you can see that. You can also see the, the title of my guest. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I hope you enjoy our conversation, but we're, we're not going to do a debate. Just sorry to, to inform you again. I think I remember you from last time, so... So just so you know, if, if you end up being too much of a like a debate bro kind of person, I'm, I'm probably just going to have to ban you at this point because, you know, at least at least contribute to the conversation. So sorry about that, Carl. I just want to keep. Uh, oh, you're fine. I was going way off on a tangent anyway. Oh, that's no problem at all. See, <laughs> I, I love these sorts of tangents. I, I like I like to hear, you know, different parts of people's <laughs> lives and, and all that sort of stuff. I find it really interesting. So. Uh, but yeah, I meant, I meant to work that into my bio, <laughs> the oh, whole sure. like having that kind of a background, being around at least those, that kind of work, sure. you know, um, and those types of people, um, you know, I, I guess cause I was, you know, raised military. My dad was a military doctor and then I joined the air force mm -hmm. and was a, 
started out as a linguist and cross trained into programming. Mm-hmm. So all desk work and, you know, no, I didn't really feel like a man until I was like well into my thirties. Oh, <laughs> uh, that. I sat at, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't mean that too seriously, but oh, okay. that, <laughs> I, I was a, I like to say I was a desk jockey. Desk jockey, sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, about 30 or so I, clicked and started working with my hands more and i think that that's a a lot of what changed the way my mind works Mm -hmm. i guess yeah i'd really get a a literal hands-on experience with with uh yeah and 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 you get to see like the manifestation of your labor and more than just a stack of paper being on the other side of the desk than it was earlier absolutely yeah uh, after after college, I got into uh, landscaping. I actually got to the point where I was running my own business for a couple of years there uh, before the kids came and I had to get more stable career. Um, so, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Being able to just look back and say, yeah, you know, whatever happens good. from here out, I built that. You know, I did that with my hands. And that's that's something that I made a difference on the earth. That's, that's a really cool feeling. So I, I totally get that, that sort of thing. That's awesome. All right. Well, uh, why don't we get back into the, the yeah. book here and we will continue. Cognitive tasks will disappear because it is evident that these unhealthy conditions are harmful to a society as a whole. Slaves can submit to them, but free men will create new conditions and their work will be pleasant and infinitely more productive. The exceptions of today will be the rule of tomorrow. The same will come to pass as regards domestic work which today society lays on the shoulder of that drudge of humanity, woman. Part two, a society regenerated by the revolution will make domestic slavery disappear. This last form of slavery, perhaps the most tenacious because it is also the most ancient. Only it will not come about in the way dreamt by the Phalisterians, nor in the manner often imagined by authoritarian communists. Phalisteries are repugnant to millions of human beings. The most reserved man certainly feels the necessity of meeting his fellows for the purpose of common work, which becomes the more attractive the more he feels himself a part of an immense whole. But it's not so for the hours of leisure reserved for rest and intimacy. The phalistery and the familistery do not take this into account, or else they endeavor to supply its needs by artificial groupings. A phalanstery which is in fact nothing but an immense hotel, can please some, and even all, at a certain period of their life. But the great mass prefers family life, family life of the future, be it understood. They prefer isolated apartments, Normans and Anglo-Saxons, even going as far as to prefer houses of from six to eight rooms, in which the family or an agglomeration of friends can live apart. Sometimes a phalanstery is a necessity, but it would be hateful were it the general rule. Isolation, alternating with time spent in society, is the normal desire of human nature. This is why one of the greatest tortures in prison is an impossibility of isolation, much as solitary confinement becomes torture in its turn when not alternated with hours of social life. Ooh, I just want to pause it right there for something that unfortunately has not changed one bit since Kropotkin's time. I mean, he really hit the nail on the head there. I mean, solitary confinement is, mm. is is torture. People are social creatures, and that's one thing that I like about Kropotkin is he really gets that. Do you have anything yeah. that, that came up for you in the, these um, last couple of passages? Um, a phalanstery, is that kind of like a dormitory or like a barracks or something? That's kind of what I'm thinking of it as. Like, like maybe it's... Maybe, maybe it's, from the phalanx? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. Yeah, like a long series of, of chambered rooms maybe something like that i guess that's a you know maybe that's something we can look up a fallon stare let's see if i can even figure out how is it i'm spelled? gonna guess Since you got the book there could you tell me how it's even spelled p-h-a-l-a-n-s-t-e-r-y and i was guessing from phalanx because i think yeah, yeah. that that word comes from like either roman or greek or something like a squad okay yeah yeah mm-hmm I think that's definitely probably where it, so it might mean like a barracks or something. Right, so, so what I was going to guess. 
it's a, a group of people living together in community free of external regulation on holding property in common. So basically it sounds oh. like a commune to me. Oh, really. cool. But perhaps, <laughs> perhaps like, like you're but, saying, oh yeah, there's, there's a picture here. Um, yeah, it kind of looks like, uh, huh. kind of like a, like, uh, an encampment almost with like, uh, a wall and then kind of a, a long building in the middle. Interesting. Interesting. Self-contained utopian community, ideally consisting of 500 to 2,000 people working together for mutual benefit. Yeah, oh. pretty much sounds like a, a commune. Like a commune, right okay. Well, yeah, it might be one of the, because I know um, like Engels and Marx talked about the utopian um, socialists, and maybe maybe that's one of an example of them or something. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was talking, in, in fact... Let me get back to it for one second so I can tell you exactly. Uh, it was talking about um, Fourier chose the name by combining the French word phalange with the word monastery. So oh. Charles Fourier, I know he's a philosopher. I have not gotten into his work at all, but I assume he's he's kind of a, he says 19th century. So yeah, maybe a little bit of a forerunner to, to Marx and, and, uh, and Kropotkin. I kind of wish I'd taken a, a philosophy class. I did take one in, in college, but I had to take something else. So I dropped it like within the first week, but it sounded so interesting. And I, I kind of regret not going back and, and taking it for an elective because. I, I, I've read about it a lot, but I've, yeah, I've never taken a course in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it is one of those things you can, you can kind of just figure out who the big figures are and, and pick up their books. So. But yeah, it'd be interesting to have gone through a class. Anyway, there was something though. Uh, shoot. Oh, the solitary confinement and solitary. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's something that uh, a lot of critics of the pandemic, I guess, or not the pandemic, but the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, or that's maybe one critique of that is the yeah. the effects of isolation. Right. Um, just. I, I, I'm not trying to pass judgment on whether or not it should have been done. Just saying right. that I mean, it definitely that was an, that was an effect. Is that Absolutely. I think people got isolated and then like it kind of messed with them. And uh, but I think I mean the fr um, the frustrating thing though is 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 you look in countries that have more of I don't I don't even know if they've pinned down what the the particular cause was, but places like New Zealand where they, I, I guess they just happen to have more of a community mind they definitely have more left-wing politics than we do i mean they've had green party members of of the parliament i think they even had a premier or not a premier a prime minister who was in the green party but anyway new zealand just obeyed the lockdowns and got through it really quick and that's just that's the frustrating part when people bring up yeah. things like isolation is yeah it really did suck for us all to be inside but if we had just pulled together and done it for like a couple months maybe like three at the most depending on how many other big countries like followed our lead which i bet they definitely would have but anyway if, if we had just done that at the beginning we would have been like we would have been coming up on like the year anniversary of of you know getting rid of covid at this point yeah and so Oh, and uh, um, but yeah, a lot of it. Um, I was thinking is people do it to themselves too, like to, yeah. just out of fear. And sure. but yeah, it's been prolonged because we didn't come together and lock ourselves down like we should have. Right. So now, yeah. but now there's people just living in fear still. I know. Probably. Like, um, also, yeah, it made me think of a a guy. I've, was getting interested in Damien Eccles. Hmm. Um, he, uh, have you ever heard of, this is a huge tangent, but uh, the, no Let's go on it. I think it was the, the West Memphis three, I think it was. Yeah. That name does ring a bell. They, yeah, they got some kids that got caught up in the satanic panic and ended up yes. doing like 18 years in prison for a murder. He didn't commit. Mm. And I think he said over those 18 years, 10 of them were in solitary confinement. Oh, my God. I can't even imagine. Yeah. That's he was saying break somebody. Yeah. He was saying like he still has a hard time remember, like recognizing faces. 
recognizing faces at that point. Wow. Yeah. Like he'll meet someone. Oh, he'll think he's meeting someone for the first time. And then they'll be like, well, you just had dinner at my house last week. It's like, that's oh, crazy. that's just that's just one of those things you don't even think about because you see so many like especially if you live in a, in, in a city and stuff, you're seeing new faces every day. Mm-hmm. Like especially like my job when I deliver, I, I see new customers all the time. But yeah, I can imagine that going that long without seeing another person. Yeah. Like, especially if they were like, just, you know, sliding his food into him through a slot or something like that. And maybe he saw one guard or something like that. Cause I'm or at least just their hands or something. Or just their hands. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't... Wow. But yeah, it just, it made me think of that. Cause, uh, yeah, that's torture. And I don't it know why it's not recognized as such. I know. Yeah. It, it definitely should be. I, I, I think, I think maybe the UN standards on torture, I think include solitary confinement, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to look that up. I don't I don't think I'm gonna do that right now, but yeah. yeah. If they do, we probably do something that makes it technically not yeah. solitary confinement. Like well, yeah, being being one of the voting members. Oh, that reminds me. Yeah. yeah, I think he did talk about that. He said that in order to make it like they had they could only do it twenty three hours a day. But right. so for his one hour of time outside of his cell, they would move him into another cell. Oh, just for another his one hour. Cell. So he didn't even get yeah. to go outside. Yeah. Oh, that's sick. That's, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not trying to. No, that's that's. Um, go too far out in the left field, but no problem. That's, that's where I, that's where I tend to stay, I guess. <laughs> well, that's a good place to remain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that definitely is relevant to, to, to what, um, Walker Pocken is talking about, you know, uh-huh. he, he's talking about the dignity of work and, and the dignity of humanity that we should be looking at in one another. We, we shouldn't be looking to torture one another. Uh, and just one more time talking to chat here. Uh, Mike Dixie Rect, you, you got to calm down. We're, we're not going to have you on the show. I have a guest tonight, as you can see. Um, so this is your final warning. I, I think I, I timed you out last time. This time I'm just going to ban you. So just, you know, keep it on what we're talking about at the very least. And if you don't have anything to add, that's fine. You don't, you don't have to make comments. Um, otherwise I think that's going to be it for you, bud. So just final warning. Uh, anyway, we are going to move on. Let, let's move on with the book. Let, let's uh, see what else he's got to say about that sort of thing. As to considerations of economy, which are sometimes laid stress on in favor of balanced theories, they are those of a petty tradesman. The most important economy, the only reasonable one, is to make life pleasant for all, because the man who is satisfied with his life produces infinitely more than the man who curses his surroundings. Other socialists reject the balanced theory, but when you ask them how domestic work can be organized, they answer, each can do his own work. My wife manages the house. The wives of the bourgeois will do as much. And if it is a bourgeois playing at socialism who speaks, he will add with a gracious smile to his wife. Is it not true, darling, that you would do without a servant in a socialist society? You would work like the wife of our good comrade Paul or the wife of John the carpenter? Servant or wife, man always reckons on a woman to do the housework. But woman, too, at last claims her share in the emancipation of humanity. She no longer wants to be the beast of burden of the house. She considers it sufficient to work, to give many years of her life to the rearing of her children. She no longer wants to be the cook, the mender, the sweeper of the house. And owing to American women taking the lead in obtaining their claims, there is a general complaint of the dearth of women who will condescend to domestic work in the United States. My lady prefers art politics, literature, or the gaming tables. As to the work girls, there are few, those who consent to submit to apron slavery, and servants are only found with difficulty in the states. Consequently, the solution is a very simple one. It's pointed out by life itself. Machinery undertakes three quarters of the household cares. You black your boots, and you know how ridiculous this work is. What can be more stupid than rubbing a boot 20 or 30 times with a brush? A tenth of the European population must be compelled to sell itself in exchange for a miserable shelter and insufficient. Hold on before we get too far away from that. Um, You know what, that that last passage about uh, emancipating women from 
the the drudgery and, and being shackled to to housework. What that reminds me a lot of is is the book that I believe we're going to cover next. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, 90 percent sure I'm going to pick uh, the principles of communism next. I like to I like to switch back and forth between like uh, anarchist and, and, and communist theory. Maybe I'll throw some some just basic leftism in there somewhere, but just for now, doing that. Um, so I, I, I think I think that's the book that Ingalls talks about uh, the family in the principles of communism, where he it, it's it's one of those ones that gets um, gets misinterpreted a lot as as the destruction of the family, but instead uh, it's it's just an expansion of the family and stuff like that. And, and so this, for me, this brings up a, a, a similar sort of thing that um, he's, he's not talking about necessarily doing away with, with all work. Of course, people are going to still have to do all those same, you know, domestic chores that they do now. It just won't necessarily be by the wife. It won't, you know, I mean, this is definitely past his time of, of talking about um, more, more modern conceptions of family with, you know, um, gay marriage and, and, and non-binary and, and all these, these other things that have, have come more to the forefront. But, but still, the idea that he's even talking about uh, doing away with, with traditional gender roles, I think, is, is pretty, pretty forward thinking of him. And, and it definitely makes me like his theory a lot more. Did you have any thoughts about that part? Uh, when was this written? Yeah, that's oh, this was pretty written, progressive. I want to say 1860s. I, I had it, you know, I had it that's... on the tip of my tongue. I mean, that's pretty progressive for yeah, anything, really. over, even if it's, you know, more than 80 years old. <laughs> well, that's for sure, too. <laughs> I mean, even today, you should hear, I mean, I, I'm sure you do uh, hear some of the way that people on the right talk. Yeah, especially roles. out here. Uh, I assume so. I mean, it's definitely in the North, too. It's just, it's not quite out in the open as much, so... Yeah, uh, I think that it's feel more comfortable doing it. <laughs> Maybe talking about it here. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this was written in 1892. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, just uh, just over 100 years, coming up on like 130. I like that, though. My lady prefers art, politics, Hell literature, yes. Hell yeah. gaming tables. Yeah. He, he, you can see that he's really taken his, his concepts and applied them as broadly as possible in his life. He didn't just stop at politics. He didn't just stop at revolution. He, he tried to apply it to, you know, workers, to factories, to domestic life. He tried to really push it into every part of his life. So, so that's one of the reasons that, that Kropotkin is like, you know, on the top of my tier of people that, that I would like to meet, you know, if, if, if I could wave a wand and go back in time or, or bring them forward in time, do like a Bill and Ted sort of thing. So cool. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Have you read uh, Principles of Communism at all? I have not. That's a good one, especially for people that are that are um, more on the beginning side of, of leftism, because it's it's really what people expect the Communist Manifesto to be. It just kind of uh, it lays everything out, you know, principle after principle. This is this is how we can do it here, here, and here, and it's just one version of communism that he lays out. Which I which I think is okay. why I'm going to pick it for the next one, but it's it's a really good one, I think. Yeah, I'm, I might dive into that one next too. Very then. cool. My, just for myself, yeah. Um, when you when you are, are reading books, are you more of like a, a print sort of a guy, or do you do you do the audiobooks too? I'm better with print, sure. but I um I have a really hard time focusing. I've got ADD oh, and okay. also small kids, and <laughs> I know how just, small kids go. Yeah. Yeah. So I love reading. I just, it's really, everything has to be perfect in order for me to do it. Um, you know, not cause I, I'm picky or anything just cause it mm -hmm. won't work. It won't happen. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, I'll just end up reading the same sentence over and over again oh, and then yeah, get mad and go that. to sleep. But, um, uh, what was, Oh, but yeah. Um, uh, so if you, if you want to try it, um, audiobooks, but aside from from the Anarchist Library, which is which is on YouTube, there, there's also a, a great service called LibriVox. It's L I B R I V O X, and they have just tons and tons of books. It's 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 not focused on theory or anything, but they do have plenty of theory books on there that are that are audiobooks. So they they actually did a collaboration with Anarchist um, with online, Anarchy Online, whatever you call it. 
Um, so yeah, if, if you're interested in, in principles of communism, that's definitely on there. And then if you, if you do want to do the print one, like there's the anarchist library, there's, there's, I want to say it's called marxist.org. Let me just look that up real quick. I use that one. Oh, okay. So yeah, marxist.org. <laughs> Marxist .org. That's a, that's a great one for, um, if you want to get into the communist side and, and get stuff for free. So definitely. So we got, uh, one chatter, a new chatter. Hello. Uh, it's Hugh. Um, and this chatter says, one of the flaws I find in lots of anarchist thought is that they end up creating a, a state, but change the names. Money becomes labor notes. And that definitely is true. I mean, that's well, kind of what I was getting at when I was talking about uh, a lot of the fighting is just over. What are we going to call it? Yeah, well, that that's true as well. Uh, one second. Let me just move this light up here. Yeah. Well, what if, instead of calling it, a, uh, you know. We call it a council or whatever instead sure, of... Sure, yeah, call it a council instead of that. But yeah, I think um, if you're unfamiliar with this book, uh, uh, It's You, the, what Kropotkin is trying to lay out is a society that that gets beyond that sort of a thing. So he, he does talk about in some of the previous chapters, which you can go to my, my YouTube channel, which is also called Bread Theory. You can look at the, the previous chapters. And he goes over how... It's not enough to just do away with the current ruling class. What you really need to do is create a new, complete, a completely new system of, of economy. And what he proposes in this book, as, as well, I, I, I assume, I haven't read Mutual Aid, but I, I plan to get into that one eventually. But he's, he's talking more about changing the economy entirely. So you have more of a gift economy where people create stuff together based on what they are interested in. Uh, to a certain extent and based on what's needed in society but like the workers basically just take over the factories that they were once a part of uh, as workers and they just become the the co-owners where they they do everything democratically uh and and they just keep on producing and then as they produce excess stuff they just kind of they they find where the needs are and they and they just give it out without any expectation of getting anything back but then by setting that precedent people just tend to say like, well, you know, I can produce a lot of, 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 let's say, cotton and I can bring it into the city and I know that if I go into any store, I can I can get the, the materials I need to keep running my farm, that sort of thing, you know. And the idea is to get beyond the, the, the uh, currency economy or the idea that people, uh, even that people are, are compensated based on, on what they produce and rather just do everything, it's, called, it's all for all is kind of what he's getting at. The idea that we all work together to produce all the things that we need for our basic lives and then uh, distribute it through through just kind of, well, I mean, the way he, he thinks of it is kind of just kind of randomly assembling networks of people that say like, you know, we're really good at figuring out who needs housing and we'll, we'll take an inventory of it and we'll, we'll help hook up people with housing that need it and stuff like that. Um, but it doesn't have to be that sort of a system. It could be any any system. But the, the, the point being that uh, rather than having this economy where, where you're just changing labor notes for for dollars, you have a you just do away with all of it. And really, that's the end goal of communism as well: is to to get to a point where you're at a stateless, classless, moneyless society where people just work for each other. It's 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 really like we've been saying. It all goes towards the same ends. It's just a matter of means of getting there and mm -hmm. staying there. Kropotkin wants to to invest the revolution in the revolutionaries and say now that the revolution or now that overthrowing the current power structure is done, we're going to make sure that all of our revolutionaries needs are met so that they will say well, this is different. We really want to defend this sort of thing. So if people try and come in and, and, and shake things up or take over or there's there's people within that, that are trying to sabotage, they will be resisted by enough people who have now had their needs met and now are living in a way that they never thought they could before that it will resist any any sort of, of destruction of, of the revolution. And communists tend to believe in in more of a centralized structure so that you can uh, have have organized defense against um, any sort of invaders or against any sort of resistors from within, and 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 really that's 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 the major difference between what Kropotkin is saying and what Anna, and what uh, excuse me communists like like Lenin were were talking about, um, but it really it all comes to the same thing. Yeah, we're trying to get beyond this idea of having money 
and 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 having one's value tied entirely to however much an employer is willing to give them you know to, to maintain them basically sorry i rambled on for a while there did you have anything oh, no that's time? fine <laughs> no i was just thinking that's why we i that's why I wanted to get into Kropotkin yeah. in general is because I don't, you know, I think we need to listen to um, everyone's ideas for how to get there and what Absolutely. to do once we get there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Another, another book that I'm really looking forward to that I plan on covering is uh, Lenin's state and revolution. And I, I found for a lot of people that end up on the, on the communist side of things, that tends to be one of the books that really you know, speaks to them and really pushes them in that direction. Yeah. So. I really enjoyed that season on Mark's madness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I got through capital state and rev and imperialism capital. and, uh, that's cut why I kind of, I'm trying to, I don't want to go, you know, I don't want to just keep rolling without looking back. Sure. But, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's no, why I'm here. D- yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's awesome. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like I, I see a lot of like I keep going back to the online thing, but mm-hmm. uh, or the fate like social media, Facebook in specific. But that is really kind of what ended up pulling me this far is because um, you know, right around the election, you know, I was seeing all this anti-Trump stuff, and then mm-hmm. started seeing some funny biden stuff and where i was like wait that's true hold on a second and it was one of my wife's friends and she was like you should friend him he's funny and i i think he's a communist <laughs> now that i know more than i i didn't have any idea then and then i was i you know all that was just in my head still like mm-hmm. almost like you don't go there land yeah. But um, yes. I saw that and like ended up seeing a lot of memes he was reposting and then mm-hmm. friended that guy and then, on you know, kept kind of networking out from there. And that's how I ended up uh, finally t- taking that dive in, you know. And um, mm-hmm. oh, but, oh, that's what I was going to say was um, uh, the word tanky. You see that get oh, thrown around a lot? You know, that's one of my least favorite words, I got to say. <laughs> Cause that's like, I was about to say, I don't want to go full blown tanky, you know? Um, if it's used but, ironically, that's one thing. But like when people are using it just to shut down conversation, I hate that yeah. stuff. Like even, even if I don't necessarily agree, yeah, what does with, that even with mean? The takes that they, they're coming up with. Well, yeah. What, what really it doesn't even mean mean? anything nowadays. It, it basically just means I don't have to listen to you because you think something different than I do. It's the same way that like, you know, the, I've never actually seen anyone call another person Anarch Kitty, but I, I've heard it as like this yeah. is one of the pejoratives against Anarch. It's one. It's like that word. It's like rad lib, and um, uh, it's it's all those sorts of I- ideas that just shut down thought and discussion like immediately. It's it's just the, shit it's, lib. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> no different favorite. than than the way that that people on the right use kami or or you know leftist or woke I, oh god i heard you ever seen abby shapiro before it's it's ben shapiro's sister she has her own channel oh, gosh. oh no i try is, not to look at <laughs> oh it is atrocious it is, it is bad as you imagine it it's just completely vapid like you know have you ever thought about going to the beach before oh, it's real fun and she'll do like a whole hour on like you know, how fun it is to go to the beach and stuff like that but but wow. anyway, um, one of her favorite phrases to use to, to hurl at the left is wokists. She's like, I don't believe in wokeism and, and wokeism. I'm like, I've never even heard anyone use that term before, but she uses it like everyone knows what what she's talking about, and it means nothing. Like you, you, you listen to her long enough, you realize she has no idea what she's even saying, and it, I, and I, I really feel it's the same way when people start throwing out the tanky and 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 and, and stuff like that. Because to be honest, like I've I've been online and like in leftist spaces for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half, maybe almost two years at this point. I think I've encountered maybe one guy who could actually fit the definition of a tanky who like only cared about the aesthetic of 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 the communist bloc military 
were like, oh, look at this military parade. Oh, look at these uniforms. And the, like, they didn't care about workers. They didn't care about anything else. That's all they oh. talked about. That's all they really liked. And like, for me, oh. that that is the only legitimate use of the word tanky is someone who just like fetishizes military as long as it's not imperialist. But, but yeah, for, by and large, those people don't actually exist. And it's just used as a pejorative to, to shut down thought and to shut down conversation. I think it, it, it really does... The it's left a disservice. Yeah, well, yeah, like like I mean, it very well may actually be. I, I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> knowing the history of like the COINTELPRO and, and stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised if there are people that are paid to just go into these these sorts of spaces and just like you know stir up shit and like you know, oh. th- throw out those sorts of languages so that people just start fighting rather than actually talking about real ideas and and really start to organize. Yeah, like it it uh. It might not be a specific psyop, you know, but right. I, like, um, it, like a self-imposed one. Like, mm. it goes back to memes for me. I'll, like everything, there's <laughs> the one about um, about how the CIA pays people to go in and and be stir up stuff to divide the left. Yeah. So if you're if you're doing it for you're yeah, you're doing the you right might want to ask them. Yeah, <laughs> you're doing it for free. Like exactly. You might wanna, Ask them for a check or something. Exactly. Or, you might. Have, I don't remember how that one looked. You, you might as well go get your Soros, Soros bucks or whatever while you're at it. You know, collect on on whatever shadowy figure is the 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 demon of the day. But uh, yeah, ah, oh, I hate I hate that sort of thing. So yeah, that yeah, I think I think that's really about all there is to to say about it. It's just it sucks. <laughs> it it doesn't help anybody. It certainly doesn't help anybody Dang learn calling. anything. It's just um. It's just like in group, out group stuff to like be able to say you bad, I good, and and <laughs> leave it at that. So yeah, but I'm glad that we can have these sorts of discussions that kind of push on beyond that sort of thing and and actually look at real ideas and and not just stop at the doorway and say ooh, I'm well, not going over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, it's different when you actually talk to a, a real human being. Absolutely, it definitely <laughs> is different. Definitely so. Which is why more in-person organizing needs to happen. But that's another matter entirely. <laughs> anyway, I think we should probably continue along with the book here. Uh, we got just about, oh, let's see, about five five or so minutes, to six minutes to go, something like that. So let's continue on. Food, And a woman must consider herself a slave in order that millions of her sex should go through this performance every morning. But hairdressers already have machines for brushing glossy or woolly heads of hair. Why should we not apply then the same principle to the other extremity? So it has not been done, and nowadays the machine for blacking boots is in the general use in big American and European hotels. Its use is spreading outside hotels. In large English schools, where the pupils are boarding in the houses of the teachers, it has been found easier to have one single establishment which undertakes to brush a thousand pairs of boots every morning. As to washing up, where can we find a housewife who has not a horror of a long and dirty work that is usually done by hand, solely because the work of the domestic slave is of no account? In America, they do better. There are already a number of cities in which hot water is conveyed to the house as cold water is in Europe. Under these conditions, the problem was a simple one, and a woman, Miss Cochrane, solved it. Her machine washes 12 dozen plates or dishes wipes them and dries them in less than three minutes. A factory in Illinois manufactures the machines and sells them at a price within the reach of the average middle-class purse. And why should not small households send their crockery to an establishment as well as their boots? It is even probable that the two functions, brushing and washing up, will be undertaken by the same association. Cleaning, rubbing the skin off your hands when washing and wringing linen, sweeping floors and brushing carpets, thereby raising clouds of dust, which afterwards occasion much trouble to dislodge from the places which they have settled down. All this work is still done because woman remains a slave, but it tends to disappear as it can be infinitely better done by machinery. Machinery of all kinds will be introduced into households, and the distribution of motor-powered in private houses will enable people to work them without muscular effort. Such machines cost very little to manufacture, If we still pay very much for them, it is because they are not in general use, and chiefly because an exorbitant tax is levied upon every machine by the gentlemen who wish to live in grand style and who have speculated on land 
raw material, manufacture, sale, patents, and duties. But emancipation from domestic toil will not be brought by small machines only. Households are emerging from their present state of isolation. They begin to associate with other households to do common what they did separately. In fact, in the future, we shall not have a brushing machine, a machine for washing up plates, a third for washing linen, and so on in each house. To the future, on the contrary, belongs the common heating apparatus which sends heat into each room of the whole district and spares the lighting of fires. It is already so in a few American cities. A great central furnace supplies all houses in all rooms with hot water, which circulates in pipes, and to regulate the temperature, you need only to turn a tap. And should you care to have a blazing fire in any particular room, you can light the gas specially supplied for heating purposes from the central reservoir. All the immense work of cleaning chimneys and keeping up fires, and a woman knows what time it takes, is disappearing. <coughs> Candles, lamp, and even gas have had their day. There are entire cities in which it is sufficient to press a button for light to burst forth, and indeed, it is a simple question of economy and knowledge to give yourself a luxury of electric light. And lastly, also in America, they speak of forming societies for the almost complete suppression of household work. It would only be necessary to create a department for every block of houses. A cart would come to each door and take the boots to be blocked, the crockery to be washed up, the linen to be washed, the small things to be mended if it were worthwhile, the carpets to be brushed, and the next morning would bring back the things entrusted to all well cleaned. A few just before we uh, continue on there, just one thing that came to mind when I was thinking about him, to, you know, when I was listening to him talk about all these modern conveniences and how they're going to do away with, with work and stuff like that, kind of makes me wonder what would happen if if workers ended up becoming the, the dominant form of, of owners or, or worker-owner uh, relationships tended up, or ah, not phrasing it right, but basically worker-owned cooperatives, if, if those became the dominant form. I wonder if we would move in a different direction when it comes to things like energy and 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 more ideas of, of green products because instead I'm sure of we would. I, I, I tend to think we would too because in, in instead of it's just cheaper. Well, I mean <laughs> for one thing, yeah. But like I mean, yeah, you you wouldn't have the entrenched families who have been like doing this like oil barons for like generation after generation who have yeah. a real vested interest in keeping the family wealth going. Instead, you'd have the, the owners, the, the factories and the drilling operations, whatever. They would they would be uh, reaping the benefit. But at the same time, I feel like you would open up the market a whole lot more because you, you're still probably going to have some sort of market, at least to begin with. Um, but it might open up the market a whole lot more to to more innovative ideas because you wouldn't have these these titans of industry just kind of blocking the door from anyone else getting in. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh I don't know how on topic it is, but it, it, it comes the whole idea of intellectual property and like, oh, um, yes, that if I feel like if that were to go away mm -hmm. and um, and everyone could share the, you know, best practices and, in you know, uh, hey, we figured out you can do it this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's awesome. We can all do it this way now. And then. Every, you know, if everyone worked together instead of right. trying to, instead of trying to outsmart each other, right? You know, like I just feel like we can get back, get to that fully automated luxury communism. Yeah, <laughs> which I a lot of people say that tongue in cheek or, or yeah, like not kind seriously, of ironically, but, but I feel like we really could be there if we didn't spend so much time destroying How half of what we've built. Yeah. Or more than half. Yeah, yeah. Just at the expense of, of, of the greatest bulk of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, but I think but, that, um, that's a, oh, another sorry, thing. Go ahead. Oh, uh, another thing that was popping up, it sounds almost like he's like like a futurist kind of trying uh -huh. to sell, try, trying to sell it. I mean, I, I should have read the rest of the book before now, but uh, at least this oh, chapter well. sounds like he's trying to sell his vision to both genders or Absolutely. you know in that day he wants everyone you know, to come along with him um the yeah the people doing the the domestic work and the people doing the um production work you know he's trying to get mm -hmm. everyone on board saying hey we could do this a lot better like you don't have to be stuck going out and toiling all day and leaving your partner at home 
doing all the work around mm-hmm. the house. That's an, another thing that, um, like, he's talking about all these things that that the modern uh, era will bring, but uh-huh. and it and it has. But the domestic workload has just shifted more. Right. Like, because you know, like, it's right. crazy thinking about um, and back then it was the women it seems but mm-hmm. having to go out and boil water so that everyone can take a hot bath yeah and no they don't have to do that anymore but no. they still get stuck for the most part they shouldn't but no yeah uh-huh. it seems like you know one person in in a relationship always ends up getting stuck with the um the domestic work instead of it being shared now, maybe I'm just projecting here because no, no, I think that that's definitely true, and and definitely as as capitalism is, is kind of, I don't know if it's 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 a symptom of it breaking down, but definitely the the relationship of of the home has been, at, at least in America, for both partners in a relationship to have to go and work, especially uh, for the the lower classes. So, yeah. That, that itself does not do away with any sort of old expectations of, of, a, of having a, a, a wife at home to do all the domestic chores. Right. So, so on even top, if on she has to work too. Yeah. I, I think it's definitely is a, 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 I'm saying definitely so much I'm getting my own head, but anyway, uh, I, I think it, it is, uh, true that by and large women are still doing those, those chores on top of also having to, yeah. to go and be a worker at the same time. So, so it, yeah, it's, they it's might kind not a, have a double bind for not, them. Yeah, it's not exactly polishing boots, maybe, or right, fi- re- refilling the candles, but mm-hmm. <laughs> but even it's still, laundry, you know, it's, it's even putting packing lunches, right? And, yeah, it's it's sweeping up, it's it's vacuuming, or even setting the room out. That still takes work. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, and but, with all the time you save, it's not like we're we're getting to enjoy that. Oh no. Yeah. Like we're having to, to, we're expected with our extra time to go out and keep chasing the carrot. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. People, it's to the point where people are, they feel, you know, bad about themselves, especially during like the pandemic when people were were forced to be at home and, and forced out of work and stuff. People feel bad sitting idly because they've been taught that, that anytime you're not working, you are, uh, you're just being a drag on society. You're not living up to your potential. All these, all these, these things that the the capitalist form of production just pushes into you to try and keep you as as a worker. It, it just kind of guilts you into to keeping on breaking your body and, and sacrificing your your time and your brains to somebody else's is benefit. So, yeah. But I'm just just thinking back to what you were saying though about patent law. Like I, I mean, just imagine oh. the creativity that would be unleashed if 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 uh, all patents were, were opened up, like the things people could learn how to do just in their own time, if they had like access to to all of this, all of the technical data that has been amassed, like it would be, you know, I'm sure there's many times the, the amount of information that's freely available on the Internet could be available to us if we would just get past this notion of, of, of allowing people to hoard knowledge for themselves. And that's that's what patent law yeah is by and large it's, it's just hoarding knowledge so you can keep an unfair advantage over whatever competition you you have that that reminded me of uh watching the internet unfold mm-hmm because uh you know there was so much potential the whole world's being connected you know all everyone can c- share information but it, it didn't end up the way you know it could have i guess like yeah like I, I was not really part of the internet during the early days or even yeah. much in, in the late 90s but but it sounds like it was a much kinder more open place back then by and large yeah so. um yeah yeah that that's definitely an interesting thing to, to think about uh thanks two for the follow i just got a new follower from i think it was satan's tv that just followed so <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> yep satan's underscore tv thanks thanks so much for the follow i hope you like what you're seeing uh hail satan, <laughs> hail, hail satan. <laughs> <laughs> um oh man that, yeah 
What am I supposed to say? <laughs> Hello, my child. Uh, <laughs> very good. Very good. So if, you, if you're just coming, if you're just joining the stream tonight, what we're doing is we're going through the audio book of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the, 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 you know, one of the thought leaders, one of the pioneers of the concept of anarcho-communism. And this is, this is one of his biggest works where he lays out his vision for a society that's moved beyond capitalism, basically. So uh, what we do is we play the audiobook and then we kind of comment on it and we kind of go off on tangents wherever, wherever the, the material takes us. So I hope you enjoy what you see and hope you stick with us. But thanks again for the follow. So anyway, um, I think we only got a couple minutes left here of the book. I think maybe we should uh, just kind of wrap it up, the audio part, and then we'll get to some maybe some closing thoughts and, and uh, head on down the road. So here we go with uh, the last couple of minutes here, about, about three minutes, just, just about three minutes left, just under. A few hours later, your hot coffee and your eggs done to a nicety would appear on your table. It is a fact that between 12 and 2 o'clock, there are more than 20 million Americans and as many Englishmen who eat roast beef or mutton, boiled pork, potatoes, and a seasonable vegetable. And at the lowest figure, 8 million fires burn during two or three hours to roast this meat and to cook these vegetables. 8 million women spend their time to prepare this meal that perhaps consists at, at most 10 different dishes. 50 fires burn, wrote an American woman the other day, where one would suffice. Dine at home at your own table with your children if you like, but only think yourself, why should these 50 women waste their whole morning to prepare a few cups of coffee and a simple meal? Why 50 fires when two people and one single fire would suffice to cook all these pieces of meat and all these vegetables? Choose your own beef or mutton to be roasted if you're particular. Season the vegetables to your taste if you prefer a particular sauce. But have a single kitchen with a single fire and organize it as beautifully as you are able to. Why has women just want to pause on that idea? Yeah, I really like that. Who was that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the the idea of having just a communal kitchen where people get together and and all cook as one, like that seems like that would be a a hugely powerful tool for kind of acting as the glue to to bind these various communities together towards a common cause. It's a place where people could just gather and, and, and discuss things the day and, and, you know, share food with one another. It sounds like a really beautiful vision to me. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And it makes me think about how I've heard theories that the humans used to be a matriarchal society mm, mm -hmm. before. And, um, yeah, maybe we need to try to go back to that. Yeah. Like just organizing <laughs> the, the home life around, uh, because yeah, a woman thought of that, you know, like right. yeah, of course, yeah, that, of course. and that makes perfect sense. Why, just you know, use one kitchen, and make uh, breakfast for the whole fam or neighborhood. Yeah, and that could that could be done with so many things. I, I remember when I first started learning about things like community gardening, and how much more so than just a place to to go and 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 you know have actual land if you lived in an apartment or something like that, have land where you could actually produce something. Much more than that, it was it was about the community first, really. It's about just kind of having the pretext and the meeting space to get together with people that, that share your interests and, and, you know, people that can become friends and, and not just people that occupy the same city as you and stuff like that. And I saw it I saw it happening firsthand. I did I did an internship for my undergraduate with a, a group that promoted community gardening within Minneapolis primarily, but, but also the surrounding areas. And it was just really cool to see these people just get together and, and do things like, you know, turn compost. And like, and some of them would even have events where, you know, you could have like a, a movie showing. Uh, there was, there was this really cool one that I remember that was, is uh, the Korean peace garden. And it was outside this, this housing projects and, the lady talked about how for uh, most of the year there was there was as as the name suggests there was a huge Korean population, and the the people, especially the older people, would get really depressed in the Minnesota winters, which is understandable. I think <laughs> even Minnesotans get depressed in the Minnesota winters. It's kind of hard to avoid. But but anyway, they would get really depressed, and then as soon as spring would come, she would see like this big uptick in the, in their mental state and their mental health. And they would they would start like 
you know, talking with one another about what they're going to plant. And they finally, once they got to go out and like plant their little plot, they, you know, they, they were like, you know, they're happiest really. And, and that was just a really cool and special thing. And they, and they had events there. Like there was a bunch of, uh, there was a large population of Somali, uh, refugees that, that also had lived in that same building. And so they had like, you know, cultural exchanges where they would do like, um, maybe traditional dances or they would play videos about the, the lands that they, they each had come from and stuff like that. And it was just like this, this awesome meeting space. And it was just this little plot of land outside of, of this towering, it was, it was, it's one of the biggest housing, uh, public housing complexes in all of the Twin Cities Metro. But just this one little plot of land was, was enough to really, really, really bring people together in a meaningful way. And so that just makes me think of, of stuff like this communal kitchen idea. Like how many things could we apply that to? I, I bet a lot, really. So that's really cool. All right. Uh, let's, let's move on. We've just got just a little bit left here. Just over a minute. It's work never been of any account. Why in every family are the mother and three or four servants obliged to spend so much time at what pertains to cooking? Because those who want to emancipate mankind have not included woman in their dream of emancipation and consider it beneath their superior masculine dignity to think of the kitchen arrangements, which they have raised on the shoulders of that drudge woman. To emancipate woman, it is not only to open the gates of the university, the law courts, or the parliaments. For her, the emancipated woman will always throw domestic toil onto another woman. To emancipate woman is to free her from the brutalizing toil of kitchen and wash house. It is to organize your household in such a way as to enable her to rear her children, if she be so minded, while still retaining sufficient leisure to take her share of social life. It will come to pass. As we have said, things are already improving. Only let us fully understand that a revolution intoxicated with the beautiful words, liberty, equality, solidarity, would not be a revolution if it maintained slavery at home half humanity subjected to the slavery of their hearth would still have to rebel against the other half. This has been a production of Audible there Anarchist. You, you can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. All right. I, I like that ending there. That was a really... Mm-hmm. Man, like... And that tends to be the case with me. Like, like I, I love ideas and dreams and stuff like that. So, like... All the theory parts of this book are, are really solid. Like I, I have come to understand and appreciate them a lot more, especially even during this this last read through of it. But it's it's the stuff like that, like the vision of like how community could really function in a cohesive way, that that people are just sharing with one another, just just making connections, just just building those bonds and stuff like that. I think more than anything, that's the sort of thing that that sold that sells me on on these sorts of ideas. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to do is to uh, drive the stake into the heart of capitalism because <laughs> that's oh, that's yes. that's oh, the yes. only thing that stops anyone from doing all this is yeah. because of that you know the bottom line. Yep. The yep. only thing I mean, if that's the only thing that they care about, and they don't even hide that fact. That's right. one of the the great things in that capital spells out is it's not, they're not being evil people. That's just what capitalism is. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's the thing I, I've thought about. That. I mean, some of them are evil. Well, sure. But, but they don't there's some poor people that are evil too. Like I, I, I'm pretty sure evil, if you even want to call it a, a concept, like yeah. a real concept is pretty yeah. well distributed just throughout the entire population. So I don't know <laughs> that rich people are uniquely evil, but you know, I, I try to think of myself like if I were in their position and, and like I had the world at my fingertips, like in, in quite literal ways, if I could send my kids to the best colleges in the land, ensure that they got, you know, top positions at, at the, the biggest firms of whatever the industry is that they were interested in in the country and, and just kind of ensure that they had whatever they wanted to, like as good of a life or better as, as I, would I, would I, would I take those those opportunities and i mean it's hard to say that i wouldn't you know yeah it, it's hard to say that that given the opportunity to 
have my kids have a brilliant life, how I would just turn that down because not everyone does. So yeah. I think the I think the important part to, to realize in that though is that it's not about the individual and, and about what the individual thinks, it's about the system as a whole. The system as a whole needs to be the focus, not just individual like the Bezoses, the Gateses, the the, the the Elon Musks of the world. Like these are these are good these are easy things to hold up as like, oh, they're evil for this reason or that thing. Oh, they do all these terrible stuff. But really, it's the system that enables them to live that sort of life that we need to, to focus yeah. our energies at dismantling. So. Yeah, that's why I why I worded it the way I did, too. Mm-hmm. It's like it's not people. Right. It's the system that it's enables system. people to do that. Like the people don't need to have that much power. No, no one does. No one needs to have more money than they could ever spend in a lifetime. That's just not a thing that ever needs to happen. I don't care how brilliant or talented you are. You could put together a dozen Amazons of of equal importance in the world. You're still not ever going to need to have more money than you can ever spend in several lifetimes. It's just, it's, I mean, there's no way to even can, can, you know, conceptualize how much money someone like a Bezos has. So, yeah, I, I saw, um, like a visual thing it was trying to mm-hmm. like show you by like you know like here's a pixel or whatever and that's a hundred thousand oh, dollars or something that. and yeah and you scroll and you keep scrolling and it's like and it's it like, talks to you while you're scrolling right because it's, it's like so minute much after minute of scrolling yeah. to just compare yourself to the uber 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 wealthy yeah. and it's just sick like that's I, I really I, I really wish that people would start viewing that sort of money hoarding as 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 hoarding not just as you know being successful but but taking away resources from everybody else that's one of the things i liked about um the marx's um imagery is using the terms like vampires and dragons right. you know it's like almost it's a great way to visualize it or, yeah it, it definitely is but you know, then again, it's it, it's it's not just the individual; it's it's the system that that enables it. So, yeah. you, you were spot on when you say we got to strike at the heart of capitalism. It's just you know, it's a matter of figuring out where it's actually weakest. Yeah, where's and, the heart? An organ. Yeah, where is the heart of it? Especially if it's not something that's being controlled by, you know, as conspiracy theorists would like you to believe, just the shadowy elite that goes back generations. And there's nothing you can do about it. They just locked in power and stuff. Like, if it's not that sort of thing, if it's just the system that's kind of running on autopilot and and creating these these monsters out of just it being it, where do you even look really to to try and strike at it? I mean, I'd like to think that that doing stuff like like what I'm doing, like at least getting people used to different ideas, is maybe where you begin to to start shifting that that equation. But it's it's a difficult problem, you know. Normalized communism. Normalized communism. Yeah, I mean, well, I think you know, even since people like Bernie Sanders, who, by all accounts, does not govern as any sort of an actual socialist, just his using the term though, I think has gone a long way to to normalize it among the general population. It's it's lost a lot of its power. Like that that red scare of of bygone eras is, is kind of running out. Also, because the material conditions are much different than back then, there aren't strong unions to promote a middle class. So. So yeah, any any closing thoughts as as we kind of wrap up the chapter for tonight? Um. A uh, better world is possible. Better world is possible. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Did you enjoy this chapter at all? Yeah. Yeah. I did. I'm glad I brought it up to read along. <laughs> okay. Um It helped to uh, look up some of those words. Yeah. Nice. But, uh, yeah. No, I enjoyed it. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, so before we close out for the night, then, um, you had mentioned that the you're not attached to any particular project yourself, but there was, there was one that you maybe wanted to give a plug for before we close. Yeah. Up. If I could shout out anyone, I would shout out Willow comrade of, uh, e girl Vanguard media. 
She is doing boots on the ground, frontline coverage, making sure white supremacists are being held accountable for their actions. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, where where, so, where do they operate out of? Or are they just kind uh, of a nationwide thing? She is yeah, kind of nationwide. Like she was in um, Minneapolis recently. I think she's oh, cool. coming to. She might maybe. Um, Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I know. I saw. I don't know if for sure. I know, oh, Charlotte. I think it was. Okay. Yeah, I'm a terrible communist. I know. No, no. <laughs> we, we are. Like I said, we're all on a journey. None of us knows everything. Like I, I know for sure. I learn about new organizations and new stuff every day. So, you know, no problem with that at all. But it looks like some really cool stuff that this group is doing. Seems a lot like uh, Unicorn Riot. Are you familiar with them at all? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's kind of what it uh, reminded me of. I couldn't think of that earlier, but when I was trying to describe it to you. Very cool, very cool. So yeah, go check out uh, E-Girl Vanguard Media. Uh, they got a they got a page on Facebook. I wasn't able to find any website for them, but they, they potentially have one too. So just go check that out. Um, other than that, I, I'd like to, to thank my guest, Carl Schultz very much for being on the, on the program tonight. I think we had a great discussion. I really enjoyed our time together. I well, hope you feel the for same. Having me. Yes, sir. Yeah. That was fun. Awesome. So yeah, um, I'm going to have some more guests coming up for uh, more chapters. Luckily, this is this is starting to, to catch on a little bit and people are starting to get interested to, to come be guest hosts. But uh, so, so next week, it'll be the same time at seven o'clock on friday we'll do more theory and and this sunday i'll be on at seven o'clock doing just more of a chill stream so just hanging out and kind of watching videos doing the react dandy sort of thing but uh yeah i really appreciate your time carl and i i really hope that we can get together for uh some future chapters if not this book then then maybe we can bring you back for for things like uh state and revolution or, or some of the other communist materials sure. so we can get that perspective as well good deal all right. Well, thanks. Thanks again. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful night. You too. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. So that was Carl Schultz. Uh, we met in one of the Facebook groups that I uh, have put together. I, I believe we met in Left Signal Boost. So that is my Facebook group that I'm, I'm trying to do my part to make Facebook just a little bit nicer of a place to be not not quite so much of a, of a cesspool of of you know <laughs> your your weird uncle and his his uh, absurd right rightist beliefs um so if you want to go check out left signal boost and then we also have i also have put together a group called um left pod posting and both of those have companion pages uh, which I, from time to time, will stream either podcasts or YouTube videos from. Just kind of without commentary, I just kind of let it run. And uh, it's just a way to expose people to um, a wider variety of leftist materials. And if you want to check out all of these various projects and find me on my various social medias and, and all of that sort of thing, all you have to do is go to Linktree and uh, search for uh, bread underscore theory and you can find links to all the stuff I'm doing including my photography that's that's one of the main ways that you can support me now before I get to the point of affiliate I am working at that I'm trying to stream more often hence the the Sunday streams uh, but but as I'm working my way up if you if you really like what you see if you're really getting something out of it and you want to toss me a couple bucks and get a cool piece of art you can go to my link tree and search for me or you find the link to uh my my photography page i do a bunch of nature photography and it's available on all sorts of different products and i get a little kickback for each one that you buy so it's kind of a it's kind of a win-win way you can get something that's a nice piece of art also functional and also give me a little bit of support for what i'm doing as, as i try to work my way up in the the left twitch community uh, other than that as i said we'll be back uh, this Friday for just kind of a, a, a whatever stream and then next or I'm, I'm sorry this Sunday at 7 for a whatever stream and then next Friday we'll be doing chapter 11 of the comment of the conquest of bread and I'll have another host for you I'm not quite sure who that's going to be yet but it's going to be one of the people that I've been talking to so look forward to those sorts of things and other than that I'm just going to say Lectam for now and 
mention that in between these videos, I'm going to go into some of my own ideas like Lectam, which is uh, a concept that I've come up with. It's, it's an acronym for what I consider to be the uh, pillars of any healthy relationship. So it's just kind of my phrase that, that I like to throw out there. But I'll get into more of what that's about in between some of these books here, or maybe on one of the Sunday streams or something like that.